Welcome to the virtual tour of Osgoode Hall Law School. My name is Jean-Paul Bevilacqua. I'm a program developer here at OGEN and uh, I'm loving seeing everyone attending uh, here today. I was in the previous session on legal life skills. It's just been such a great week. So thank you for continuing that. I have no doubt that Elise's presentation today will continue that trend. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items as we start. Um, this is an interactive tour, so please, uh, for any questions, comments, use the Q&A uh, function or the chat. I'll be monitoring throughout, and I will pass those questions along to Elise as she's presenting. Um, any links that will need to be shared um, uh, will be uh, put by Ra Ross or myself in the chat. And um, this presentation will be recorded um, so that it can be used as a uh, educational tool uh, going forward. Um, and before we formally begin the tour, I would uh, like to acknowledge that even though we are all over Ontario, I am coming to you from Toronto and that uh, is where Osgoode Hall Law School is. And um, Toronto is, uh, is on the land of the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that this land is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today I would also, given that we're talking about Osgoode Hall and the, uh, the highest court of the province and the Law Society, is housed at Osgoode Hall. I would also like to bring our attention to the calls to action, uh, especially those under the justice categories, calls number 25 to 42 in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. Um, so, um, you know, and, and mindful of the work that we as um, here at OGEN and the Law Society and Osgoode Hall as justice sector professionals are tasked to do based on their report. Um, and I encourage those in the audience to, um, to consult, especially the sections that, as I listed uh, that are directly applicable here today. So now with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker. Elise Pune is a curator at the Law Society of Ontario. She plans and implements public programs relating to the heritage of the Law Society of Ontario and Osgoode Hall, such as tours, exhibitions, articles, and other special events. Um, and I am very excited for today's program and previous role a few years back here at OGEN, I had the opportunity to work on, on, on the written content, some of the written content for this tour, as well as for Arts in the Court. So I'm really excited to be revisiting uh, this material today with uh, Elise, and I will now pass it over to her uh, very capable hands to take us through Osgoode Hall. Welcome, Elise. Hello, hello, hello. This is so exciting to be back uh, doing the Summer Institute tour. So let's just give me a second to um, share my screen with you. All right. So I hope you're seeing the presentation. Yes, we see it. It's perfect. Great. Perfect. Thank you very much. So um, as I said, um, it's really exciting to be back doing the Summer uh, Law Institute. Um, obviously, it's going to be a very different tour because I'm sitting in my office instead of wandering the halls of the building. And um, I don't know where you're sitting, but it's obviously uh, not Osgoode Hall. So. Um, so we are missing a little bit of something in doing this tour in the sense that you don't have kind of the physical sense of the space, the, the sounds of the courts and the people walking through and all that. But on the other hand, this allows me to use um, archival material, which provides a lot more context than what you get in the regular tour. So I wouldn't look at this as, a, as an inferior tour. It's more like a complementary um, uh, complimentary tour. So I hope I hope you enjoy it. So let's get going. So welcome to Osgoode Hall and all its glory. And actually, it could almost be like today. So as you know, um, Osgoode Hall was named in the honor of William Osgoode, who was the first Chief Justice um, of the province. 
Um, Osgoode Hall houses the highest courts of the province, so the Court of Appeal for Ontario and the Superior Court of Justice, and also the Law Society um, of Ontario, who is the governing body of lawyers and paralegals in the province. So this is going to be mainly a tour um, of Osgoode Hall, um, the building, but I will cover also some information about the courts and the Law Society as we go. So as you can see, Osgoode Hall hasn't changed very much over the years. So this is a photo from 1868. And let's see if I can use my, my laser pointer. There you go. So as you can see, um, it hasn't changed very much at all. Um, although Queen Street is a slightly in a slightly better condition nowadays and can even kind of guess the, the streetcar tracks right here. So here's another view of Osgoode Hall at the end of York Street. So if you take the GO train uh, to come downtown, this is the view you would have from the corner of York and um, I guess it's front. So Osgoode Hall has always been a little bit of an odd creature. And as you can see in this photo, um, it, it really stands out. So um, the scale of the building and the property and what was a district of single family homes. And I remember uh, reading a story about a group of young uh, women from a college in Upper New York State who came to visit Toronto and they were invited to Osgoode Hall to, for a visit. And at the end of the tour, they all went up to the roof to get a panoramic view of the city. So it kind of gives you an idea. And you can see from the photo that um, you could get a panoramic view of the city from the roof. Um, it also had a very business and public purpose and what was, a, as I said, a mostly residential neighborhood. It had professional occupants and what was in a working class area. Um, it was also very WASP in what eventually became one of the city's main reception areas for new immigrants. And it was also very rich in um, a, um, a neighborhood called the Ward, which was once one of the city's uh, poorest areas. And as you can see, even today, Osgoode Hall still, stand out, uh, still stands out, although I'm pretty sure that you cannot get a panoramic view of uh, the city from the roof. Now, Osgoode Hall is so old, at least by Toronto standards, that it was already old in 1906. So if you look at this postcard, um, I, I, I like the way they um, describe it as a quaint, rambling old place. Um, so it's still old, it's still uh, rambling, quaint, I don't know, but anyways. Now, Osgoode Hall is old, but it's not evenly old. So as you can see from this plan, um, the, the building is not so much one structure as a bunch of boxes that have been stuck together over the years. So, um, so it makes for a very, very when, when they mention rambling, that's the rambling part. So it can be a very confusing building. And if you've had a chance to, to come to Osgoode Hall, um, you know that it's really easy to get lost. Now, um, another reason why the building is very confusing is that it has two owners. So um, if you look at here, so everything here um, is owned by the Law Society of Ontario and occupied by the Law Society of Ontario. This part here in white is owned by the government of Ontario and occupied by the government of Ontario. This part here is um, owned by the government of Ontario, but occupied by the Law Society. And these little this little boxes here are owned by the government of Ontario. And depending on what area you're in, um, you could either run into law society people or government people. So it is very confusing. Um, to make things more complicated, um, there is a large lawn here, which belongs to the government of Ontario. And the front lawn here belongs to the Law Society of Ontario. So um, yes, but the Law Society is responsible for the maintenance of the West Lawn as well as the South Lawn. So as you can see, it gets complicated. The ramp at the front of the building um, is technically, actually, let me back up a little bit. So the shoveling at 
in the front of the building is technically a law society responsibility. However, when they installed the ramp, there were some questions as to where the shoveling was going to stop. So it got very complicated and eventually they settled on putting glycol lines in the ramp so that the snow would melt on its own. So these are the kind of issues again that we deal here. Now the reason why the building is so complicated um, goes back far in history. So originally the property was owned entirely by the Law Society of Ontario. And uh, from the very start they'd hoped that the courts would move into Osgoode Hall and that they kind of uh, pool their resources to build a um, a court building that was worthy of the capital of the province. Now, the government resisted for a long time, and it's only after the Upper, Can the Upper Canada uh, Rebellion in 1837 that, um, that things started to change. So what happened is that the government needed barracks for the soldiers that were uh, stationed at, um, in Toronto, and um, they rented Osgoode Hall as barracks for almost six years. Um, at the end of these six years, they moved out, but the building was in very rough shape. And when the Law Society tried to collect, um, the government argued that it was uh, normal wear and tear, and they refused to pay. So you can see it was not a very good relationship. Um, after many discussions and the Law Society threatening to sue the government, they finally came to an agreement where the government would become the courts, would become uh, a tenant of the law society, they would move in into the building, and the government would contribute to the repairs and um, the, the expansion of the building. So that's the way until it was until 1874, at which point the law society started um, to regret its decision. The, the province was growing very quickly, the, the, um, the size of the justice system was growing very quickly along with it. And um, it was a drain on the resources of the law society. So at that point, they decided to split the property. As you can see, it wasn't done very quickly, uh, very um, cleanly. And um, yeah, so basically that's the way it's been since 1874. So you have two owners, um, both in a building called Osgood Hall. And um, Anyways, it, it gets a little bit uh, confused. When I started working here, you could tell um, who owned what by the color of the carpets, but unfortunately they've changed the carpets and we don't know anymore. So let's keep on going. So this is what the building looks like in the real world. So it occupies approximately 42% of the property nowadays. So one of the things we're quite famous for are our grounds. And this is a photo from um, 1920. And I apologize that, you know, it's not exactly the best view of the gardener, but, and as you can see, then as now, uh, we have onlookers who like um, watching the gardener at work. And I bet you they're asking him what to do with their spring bulbs. So this is a view uh, from Osgoode Hall looking down York Street towards um, Union Station. And um, I'll, I'll bring your attention to how busy the street and the sidewalks are. You can see the animation, it's lively, it's, I'm sure it's noisy. And then when you look at the other side of the fence, um, look how quiet it is. And you know what? It's still something that works. Um, it's still the same way. So as soon as you cross that fence, um, things quieten down quite a bit, which amazes me really, because when you think about it, this fence is just a few metal sticks with a lot of holes around them. So the fact that this, this very you know, lacy structure can create such a difference in the noise level um, and the animation is just amazing to me. So if you compare this photo to the original image that I showed you of Osgoode Hall, you can see that the trees have grown a lot bigger. Um, and that the, the increased amount of um, shade has forced us to change the, the planting, the type of plantings we have over the years because um, most you know, regular plants have a hard time surviving in this kind of shade. But it's a, it's a wonderful space. Um, like in the summer when it's hot, um, it's a great place to, to stop by. 
And these are our famous crab apple trees in the spring. And also our famous summer bulbs. So um, for over a century, we had um, tulips planted on the grounds. And um, I can't remember how many, it's, we're talking thousands of bulbs of tulips that are planted. And for some mysterious reason, about 10 years ago, the squirrels developed a love of tulip bulbs and um, they were eating them all. So we've had to switch to daffodils um, since then. And um, so if you come through the grounds in the spring, you will be greeted by our tulip, uh, sorry, daffodils. Now, having such a big piece of um, empty property in the downtown core can attract the wrong type of attention. And over the years, the city has tried to turn the grounds into a park on several occasions. And there was talk of expropriating part of the property to widen Queen Street. So when they built um, old uh, new city hall um, in the 19th century, some people wanted to build a church on the property and then a courthouse. Um, at some point, as the law society was growing, the, they even considered building a library, uh, an underground library under the front lawn. And if you've been following the news, um, uh, Metrolinx is currently planning on putting a subway station on the south west corner of the property. So going back to the 60s, the government even wanted to build an office tower on the West Lawn, and we were very lucky that that was stopped. So another thing that Osgood Hall is famous for is um, its fence and its famous or so-called cow gates. And um, it is a beautiful, it is a beautiful gate. This is a rendering, um, an architectural rendering, uh, an architectural drawing, sorry, from um, the architects who actually designed the fence. So as I said, um, the fence is now part of the Toronto folklore for its gates that are said to be um, cow gates. And as you can see, people have tried to prove um, that they were cow gates. And I can tell you that they work. Uh, these people are law students who were here um, when the law school was still at Osgoode Hall. And um, yeah, poor boss, he couldn't get through. Now, the reason why you had students, um, as I said, is because Osgoode Hall Law School was here. In fact, Osgood Hall, the Osgoode Hall Law School that is now at York University uh, was started at Osgoode Hall here um, in 1889. It was actually the fourth law school to be started at Osgoode Hall, although um, at that point, the concept of a law school was very different um, that, than what um, we know now. But anyway, so our students liked playing their pranks. And here you have the class photo for the, the class of 1908. And you've got the poor lonely woman here. Um, the law school was a very important component of the Law Society in its early days. And it's probably one of the main reasons why the Law Society was founded in the it, originally. So the Law Society was created in 1797 to have some kind of control over who practiced law and how they practiced it. And, and how people practice, sorry, who, pract who practices law, um, education is a big component of that. So you controlled admissions, and you also trained um, these new lawyers. So going back to the cow gates, because they're an important part of our, of our history. So this is what, this is a photo from England. And this is what a typical cow gate looks like. So uh, this panel here is hinged and it swings between the two sides. Sometimes you'll hear these, these gates being called kissing gates because they lightly kiss each sides of the enclosure as you get through. Now, um, cows, sheep, 
horses just can't manage uh, this maneuver. So the beauty of these gates is that they're always closed. So they're always um, effective in preventing animals from either entering or exiting um, a field. Now, um, I will show you, these are our gates. And even though they, you can't move this panel anymore, they're basically built on the same design. For some mysterious reason, very soon after the fence was put in, that panel that swings uh, was immobilized in the pavement. And I was trying to figure out why on earth would they do that, spend all that money to build these gates and then suddenly close them. So my, my hypothesis on this, let's go back to this one here, is that this gate here is very light. So if you go in and you push the gate in front of you and backwards, sorry, um, it's not an issue. Um, and it's easy to start it going and it's easy to stop. Now our gate is made of cast iron and it probably weighs over a ton. So um, if you remember your physics classes, you know that getting a panel of metal that's a heavy, you know, a ton is really difficult. And once you start it moving, it's really hard to stop it. And my guess is that we probably had a few judges and lawyers get their fingers caught in there. And that was the end of the moving panels. So it's very unlikely that our gates were meant for cows. And one of the best arguments um, for that is that by the time the fence was put up in 1867, so the fence is the same age as Canada, um, the city of Toronto was already a bustling city. You had streetcar service, you had gas, you had water. It was, it was a, a big city. You didn't have herds of cows going through the streets. And even if there had been, for the longest time, the Law Society had a picket fence around the property, which would have been just fine for stopping cows. So it, it's a very expensive way of stopping a problem that probably wasn't even a problem at the time. So why put such a an extensive fence around the property. Well, this is a photo from 1856. So this is the intersection of King and York Street. And as you can see, there are fences everywhere. I mean, even here, you don't have, there's barely any lawn and you still have a fence. So fences were part of the 19th century. That's just the way people did things. Now, um, when I was doing, doing research on a, an exhibition about our fence, um, I noticed that throughout the 20th, uh, the 19th century, there was a, a pattern that was repeated many times. So you had a number of institution organizations that became more confident about their role. They would build themselves grand um, headquarters. And then by the time they were finished building these grand buildings, there was no money left. So they would start um, saving to build fences that were in keeping with their architectural you know, treasures. And eventually they would build themselves um, you know, metal fences. And that's exactly what happened at Osgood Hall. So this is Osgood Hall and its picket fence, which you have to admit doesn't quite look right. And then a few years later, it finally was able to afford its iron fence. That's much better. Although I can't speak about the condition of Queen Street, but the fence definitely is better. So if you have any questions about, um, about what we've seen so far, please feel free to ask. Um, it's a lot easier to answer the questions as we go, so I don't have to go you know, back several slides. So I'll let you, um, if you have any questions. Okay, so we're just about to go in. This is the main entrance of the building. And you're lucky since you're with me, we'll be able to skip the security check. So we are now in the rotunda or the atrium, um, just past the security checkpoint. And this is more or less the geographic center of the building and the heart of the courthouse. Now, as I mentioned earlier, 
Um, Osgood Hall is the home to the highest courts of the province, the Court of Appeal for Ontario, and parts of the Superior Court of Justice. So all the appeals of the province end up here. So this part of the building dates from um, about 1860. So this is the second floor. And all the stone that you see here is Caen stone, which is a very fine limestone um, from the north of France that, that was used in buildings such as the Tower of London and Westminster Abbey. So if you don't mind looking up. So this is the skylight that lets a beautiful light come in. And the structure itself is, um, is original to the building. Although in the 1960s, the, that whole skylight was in very bad condition and it needed to be restored. And because it was um, amazingly expensive to do a proper restoration, they simplified all the iron work and also the glass. So um, this kind of grayish glass that you see here would have been um, originally um, etch glass, and I'll show you some of that in the Great Library. But this kind of um, more saturated colors um, glass in there is most likely original. Now, if you have it, ever have time to kind of spend um, at Osgood Hall, you'll notice that there's a lot of carvings uh, throughout. And it's quite amazing that it's not, um, a lot of them are very different. So uh, that's, you look at the columns and, um, you know, everything is different. It just amazes me the amount of work um, that was put, at the investment that was put into this building. Now, the top of the arches, um, like the keystones in the atrium are also um, very different. And we were trying to figure out what they meant, if there was a meaning of them individually, but also as a group. Now, the Victorians like to see all aspects of human activity as interconnected. And we were wondering if this, these keystones um, represented that, but there were some really odd things and we couldn't quite figure out what it was. So um, some of them are fairly easy to read. So here you have the Victoria Regina, which um, represents Queen Victoria, who was the, the, the queen at the time um, this part of the building was built. You've got a symbol for architecture. We think this means war uh, with the wreath and the, and the, the knife. Um, here you have a symbol of government with a mace and a beaver. It's the weirdest beaver I've ever seen, but it is a beaver. Um, this would represent the building trades. Um, let's see, the arts for sure. We know that this one represents commerce. Now, the one that really stumped us, but that was also um, the key to understanding uh, the keys is this one here. So it's an upside down uh, torch. And usually this is a symbol for death. And um, death is not usually considered as a major sector of human activity, but on the other hand, it is a major sector of law, uh, with, you know, with estates and wills and things like that. So what we think at this moment, and obviously this is just an hypothesis, is that these keys represents sectors of human activities where law plays an important role. And um, that would make perfect sense in a, in a building like Osgood Hall. So this is the statue that is in the middle of the atrium. It's a memorial for um, those who died during World War II, so all the lawyers and law students who died. Um, it's a woman holding a baby, and it's a symbol of looking towards the future. So it's a very unusual and also a very positive theme for a war memorial. Um, it was so unusual, in fact, that when it was unveiled, the artist was so nervous that he went and hid behind a pillar uh, because he was afraid that um, a nude would not be well received. Um, he had nothing to worry about. Everybody loved it, and um, it's been there ever since. 
So in the atrium, you will also see some of the largest paintings in the art collection of the Law Society. On this part, in this part of the building, you have the portraits of the chief justices. In the Law Society part of the building, you have the portraits of the treasurers of the Law Society. So let's go take a look at one of the courtrooms. We'll go to courtroom number one. So here we are. This is the bench in courtroom number one, which is a court of appeal um, courtroom. And um, because they hear appeals in this courtroom, in fact, because they hear appeals, um, appeal cases in most of the courtrooms at Osgood Hall, you usually have three seats um, on the dais. So the middle one here is usually where you'll find the Chief Justice of the province. So here are the judges of the Court of Appeal in 1923. And you'll notice that, whoops, well, let's head back a little bit. You'll notice that uh, the judges have nice ergonomic furniture nowadays, but you have to admit that these chairs look so regal. And if you're interested, Next time you come to Osgood Hall, we've got many of these chairs in the hallways. So um, you, you're welcome to sit in them. They're very popular during doors open. So there's another view of courtroom number one and its layout is uh, quite typical of the courtrooms at Osgood Hall. So let's head over to courtroom four. So there we are, we're just outside courtroom four and you can see one of our other paintings. Um, if you've ever been to the Osgood Hall restaurant or if you've been to the Summer Institute before, um, it's usually held in Convocation Hall. And this is the door you would take from the main entrance. Now courtroom four is used by the other court at Osgood Hall, the Superior Court of Justice. And it's usually used for motions and appeals in front of one judge. So here we are. Um, this used to be the former court of Queen's Bench. It's a photo from 1920. Now this is what the, the courtroom looked like in the 1970s. There was a major renovation at Osgood Hall in the seven in the early 70s. And uh, Queen Elizabeth II was uh, coming to reopen the building. So in her honor, and you have to say that um, the standards of heritage preservations uh, were different in those days. Um, so in, in, in order to honor Queen Elizabeth II, they decided to paint the room in the royal colors. So you have the purple, gold, and red. And what you can see here is that the walls at the bottom were in some kind of a baby blue. It was dreadful. It was truly dreadful. I was there. This is the color um, the room was when I started working here. And um, I think the only advantage of this color scheme is that it would keep you awake because it was so kind of psychedelic. So in 2004, they decided to uh, bring back the courtroom to its original look. So you can see the project in progress. And here is uh, what it looks like now. So one of the challenges was to determine the original color scheme when all you have are black and white photos. So one of the things they did is that they took core samples of all the walls and the, the moldings and all that everywhere they thought they could be a change in the color scheme and they analyzed those under a microscope. And at that point, they were able to see all the various layers and determine what the original colors were. Um, this light fixture is a reproduction, so we don't really know what used to hang in there, but um, this, is, this was taken from an archival photo of another courtroom of a, a similar time period. So here we have the figure of justice. And unfortunately, um, one of the scales fell off the ledge and her scales are now tilted, which obviously is not a very good symbol in a courtroom. Very cool comment from uh, Ryan in the audience that uh, their family did a 
the father's plastering company did many of the plaster repairs during the renovations of the early 2000s. Oh, really? Oh, that's really cool. It's not easy to find people to do this type of work anymore. Okay, so this is the uh, the Royal Arms. Um, you don't always see them in courtrooms these days, but uh, we have them at Osgood Hall in most of the courtrooms. And they represent the authority of the states within the courtroom. Brynn is asking if the scales uh, of justice are still tilted at these. As far as I know, I haven't been in there in a little while, but as far as I know. So it's not a good symbol in the courtroom, but it's a great conversation piece. So I don't know if you can see here, but there's a hierarchy of upholstery in here that represents a professional uh, hierarchy. So the front row was meant for the King's councils and the Queen's councils, so the senior lawyers. It was also used by um, the lawyer that was hired by the Law Society to make notes on the cases that were taking place. So when you go to the Great Library and then you look at reported cases, in, in many cases, the person who was making those notes was sitting in that seat here. Now, the second row here, which has some padding, but not too much, was reserved for the regular lawyers. And as you can see, these are still the seats that are used most often. The ones at the back with no padding whatsoever uh, were meant for the law students. So I was mentioning earlier how the concept of law school had changed. And in the 19th century, for some time, part of your training was to sit in the courts and make notes on the cases that were taking place. Now, this was a mandatory activity that the Law Society um, um, imposed on the students. And um, all these wonderful people who ended up turning, you know, becoming chief justices and, and heads of states and all that um, did not appreciate it all the time. So apparently, one of the things they used to do is that Law Society had this ledger where you had to write down your name to show that you had been in attendance. And what they would do is that part of the group would go and party in town, the others would go and sit in the courts. And when they signed the book, they would leave um, spaces between the, their names so that when the the other group came back from their party, they'd be able to write in their names and no one knew that they had been away. Who knows if that's true, but it's a good story. Okay, let's see if I can get my cursor back. So let's head towards the Great Library. So this is the main reading room of the Great Library around 1890. And, and if you've been there, and you'll see um, with the next photo that the space hasn't changed very much. It's still very recognizable. Now, this weird thing in the middle of the space here um, is an electric light fixture. This is one of the this is the first attempt of the Law Society to bring electricity into the building. And it was first tried in the library because um, they were open after hours and they needed artificial light. Now, if you know, if you've seen um, old um, street views of cities um, at that time period, you will recognize these things on an individual basis. So these are arc lights and you, they were used for street lighting. Um, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, they're amazingly bright. So imagine what four of them grouped like that in the middle of an enclosed space would have been like. So when you go through the records of the Law Society, you can see that people were blinded by, by these. The quality of the light was awful. Uh, we're talking like baseball diamond kind of lighting. So it was terrible. And the Law Society actually wrote the gas company to come back and reinstall gas because electricity just wasn't cutting it. So I find it kind of interesting to see how, you know, we have this perception of um, technology as a linear, linear process, but in fact, um, you know, it, 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 it isn't always the case. So they reinstalled electricity later on when um, incandescent light bulbs became more widely available. So here's a modern view of the library. And as you can see, it looks very much the same. 
So the, the main reading room uh, was built in 1857 at the same time as the center part of the library that we saw with the atrium and courtroom four, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, the Law Society had um, started buying books even before they had uh, Osgood Hall. So it was an important component of making sure that lawyers were competent. The Great Library remains the largest private law library in Canada. It has approximately 100 uh, thousand volume at this point. There used to be more, uh, but now with the availability of um, legal databases and all that, um, there's fewer uh, works on paper, although it's still an important part of the collection. Elise, can you talk a little bit about the access to the library, like who can use it, uh, the hours, things like that? I would refer you to the Law Society's website because these things tend to change. But generally, um, actually the library is open to the public. So anyone can use it. But if you're not a lawyer, a paralegal, a law student, there are some restrictions to access um, the online databases. A lot of those are um, cost, they're costed by use. So um, th there are limits to that, but the library is accessible. As for the hours, as I said, um, check the Law Society's website. That, that That's the best way of figuring it out. Thank you. I've just posted a link in the chat for anyone. Who's that's interested. great. Thank you. Okay, so um, so the Law Society is funded through the fees that our licensees pay, pay on a yearly basis. And the collection includes um, things like legislation, government documents, law reports, journals, textbooks, continuing professional development materials, um, et cetera, et cetera. I know they used to have a great collection of uh, lawyers jokes, um, but I don't know if they still have that collection around. So this is the amazing fireplaces at the west end of the room. Now we know that there was a central heating in this space from the very beginning. Like there's no way this tiny little fireplace could have heated the whole place. But we do know that it was a uh, functional fireplace because there, when you look at aerial photos of the building, um, there was a chimney above there. Now the mantle, on the other hand, is humongous. And just to give you a sense, this is a doorway, and this is a, a big doorway. Like it's not a, a, a standard doorway. And you can see how big um, the fireplace is. The portrait above the fireplace is a portrait of John Beverly Robinson. Um, he was the Chief Justice of Ontario and a treasurer to so the president of the Law Society. The land on which Osgood Hall was built was purchased from him. If you want to talk about having a successful career, and I don't want to, to discourage anybody, um, he became attorney general, acting attorney general at the ripe old age of 21. He had not been called to the bar at the time. And the only thing I can say is that um, he became, he got the job because his articling principle was called, it was killed during the war of 1812. So Okay, so it wasn't entirely on his own merit, but on the other hand, he kept the job for two years, so he must have done something right. So here you have uh, some of the etched glass that I mentioned to you earlier. So the, the atrium skylight would have had glass similar to that. And again, you can see the VR under the crown. It's the cipher of Queen Victoria who was the, the monarch at the time the, the library was built. Now, if you look up, you can see the dome in the great, um, the main reading room. So it's not a real dome in the sense that you can't see it from the outside. The building used to have a, a real dome, um, but apparently it was leaky. And when they rebuilt it, they decided to play it safe. Now, all that you see here is all made of plaster. Now, this is the reverse view of um, <clears throat> the view we saw with the fireplace. Um, so we're looking east now. These things here are inkwells, and I have a few of those in the artifact collection. And this window here at the end, 
has now been replaced with a war memorial. And we'll get closer to that in a moment. There you are. So you can really see the difference in theme between the memorial downstairs, so the woman holding a baby, which was a very positive, forward-looking um, um, kind of sculpture. You were putting war behind them. They were putting war behind them and moving forward. In this case, you can really see that they were mourning their dead. And um, one of the big difference between the two memorial is the number of names on it. So. The one in the atrium has 51 names. This one has 150 names. So I did a quick calculation and we basically lost 6% um, of the legal profession during World War I. So you can understand why people needed time to mourn. Now this sculpture was created by artist Francis Loring. Um, it's, it's one of the very few um, women artists that were active at the time. And in case you're wondering, and this is a kind of a neat piece of trivia, her model was the captain of the local YMCA swim team. Now, right next to the, more, the memorial in the showcase, there's a piece of rock and we call it the rock. Um, so the rock is, no, actually, let me backtrack a little bit. Okay, so in England, you have um, four institutions that are more or less the equivalent of the law society. It's, it's, the system is different there, so it's, it's not perfect. Um, there are a lot of um, connections between the Inns of Court and the law society, at least in the early days of the institution, from traditions and all that. If things like the name of um, convocation when um, the board of the law society meets, or the, the, the name of treasurer for the president of the law society, these are all things that came from the Inns of Court. Now, the Inns of Court are all located in the heart of London and in medieval buildings. And during the Second World War, they were heavily damaged uh, by aerial bombings. The Law Society and a number of universities and other institutions in Canada um, pool their resources and send them uh, money to help them rebuild. And I guess this was before the days of Carlton cards. So um, the Inns sent um, a piece of uh, rubble from when they, the original buildings as a, a way to acknowledge their contribution. Can imagine what the postage would have been on that. Now let's cross over to the other end of the library. Now this is my favorite room uh, in the building and it's called the American Room. And it was completed around 1895. Um, it was built to house the Law Society's American collection, which is kind of a, an unusual collection in a Canadian library. Now our library is quite old. Um, it was started in 1826, and at the time, there was very little Upper Canadian jurisprudence. So they relied on the British law, and they also looked at um, um, American cases as a source of inspiration. So the American system was also a common law system, and they were dealing with a lot of the same issues that we were dealing here. So even though the judges here were not bound by the decisions of the American courts, um, they were still a good um, reference source. Now, this is an architectural rendering um, of the, the space. We don't actually know whether there used to be um, bookcases in the middle or not. They might have been removed. Um, I mean, these drawings were used basically to sell the project to a client. So um, it's possible that they removed the, the bookcases in the middle so just so you could see the features of the room. So um, some of the major features of the room that are still there, you can still, you can see in this drawing. So the spiral staircase and also the two tiered arrangement with the balcony that runs around the wall. So there you go. So one of the considerations when they, when the Law Society commit, uh, commissioned this room was to have as much room as possible for the books. And that's why, again, you have this two-tiered arrangement and the spiral staircase, which is 
I can tell you this thing is terrifying, especially if you have a pile of books. Um, but it has a very small footprint. So it allows that whole back wall to be full of books um, rather than be, being full of stairwells. Now, this is a view of the second floor and the, um, the cove. And what's kind of cool is that um, this part here, which is made of a material called staff. So it's not quite plaster. It's a, it's a mix of plaster with um, fiber and different kinds of binders. Um, that cove was done by the nephew and um, son of the, the plasterers who did the, the ceiling in the great library. So it's a family affair. Now, if you look up, this is uh, a detail of the skylight in the American room. It's an important source of light uh, for, uh, for the space. It's also an important uh, source of grief. Um, it tends to be leaky. So um, at times we've had the librarians run out with plastic sheeting to protect the books. Um, we've had issues with workers dropping their tools through the to the skylight. And now as part of their contract, the workers have to have their tools uh, tied to their belts. And um, we've also had squirrels come in through there. And if you know, um, squirrels love paper because they use it to build their nests. So I can just imagine the face of the first squirrels that came through there and saw all the books out there. It must have been heaven. So there you are. Um, this is something that you would not see if you go in the library nowadays. Uh, this is a photo that was taken when we installed the, the sprinkler system under the balcony. And um, you can see like, the, the iron supports for the balcony. And also if you have an old house, you've got the old knob and tube uh, wiring, which um, is no longer functional, but it's still there. Okay, so we're just about to cross into the oldest part of the building. I'm just wondering, are there any questions to about the library or anything else we've seen so far? Okay, we're good. Okay, so um, so we're just about to cross into the wing that was built in 1832. So that was the original Osgood Hall. And uh, depending on who you're talking to, um, it's called the Benchers Quarters, the Benchers Wing, the East Wing, the South Wing. It's got a thousand names and um, it's very confusing. Now, this is a map of Toronto in 1834. So that's the year that the town of York became the city of Toronto. And you can see Osgood Hall was right at the edge of town. In fact, when Osgood Hall, the first wing was built, uh, you could not hear cases at Osgood Hall because we were outside of the limits of the city. Now, if you ever wonder why Front Street is called Front Street, it's because it used to be at the front. Um, so all this land here, so if you, again, if you take the GO train when you come in, um, you're Union Station is probably somewhere in here, in the middle of the bay. So all this has been infilled, and that's why, um, and mostly with garbage. So that's why when they built the Rogers Center or when they built any new tower now and they dig down to do their their foundations, they come across they come across old um, ships and all kinds of stuff. You're basically um, digging through a 19th century garbage dump. So here we are, right there. Now I told you that Osgood Hall really stood out, and it really did, and people were really proud of it. So this is. Um, um, extracted from a city uh, street directory for the city that was printed in 1834. So the same time as the photo that uh, the, uh, the floor, the, the, the map that I showed you. And um, Osgood Hall is mentioned at least nine times in there. So it's mentioned on uh, Lot Street, with, which is the old name of Queen Street. It's mentioned on York Street. And then every single intersection between York uh, between um, on York, um, between Front and and 
lot, they would say something like, oh, and from here you have a beautiful view of Osgood Hall. So they really did not want you to miss it. And you can see why, because it was really uh, quite a special building. I love these cars. So that's a photo from the 1920s. And there's another photo from the 1920s. And you can see how, you know, when I was showing you the all the boxes, so this is the edition from 1891. This is the edition from 1882. This is the original wing. And then this was, um, it was first built in 1833, it was renovated in 46, and then it was totally rebuilt in the 1850s, and this is 1847. And then there's a whole bunch of wings behind that that we can't see. So we're just about to go in. Um, as I said, this was the wing that was started in 1829. Originally, there was no um, portico, no columns in the front here. And the reason why that was added was uh, because when they built the wing on the other side in 1847, the wings were not exactly the same. So by putting the, the porticos in front, they just kind of fudged it a little bit and made them look the same. So if you ever have a chance to stand, between, stand in front of the two wings, you'll see that there are slight differences. Um, some of them have been kind of erased over time, but um, the two wings were not the same. So this is a wing that with a lot of history, not that there isn't a lot of history in the rest of the building, but this one is particularly um, full of history. So this is an example. So um, let me see where I'm going to start with this. OK, so this is a, a um, business card for a tailor in London, England. And it shows you how to take measurements for a new a custom suit or uniform. Sorry, I'll have to take a, a quick sip of water here. Just a reminder, if anyone has questions, um, please use the Q&A or chat functions. Thank you. OK, I'm back. So um, this card was found behind um, a fireplace mantle in the office of our treasurer. This fireplace, um, there was always a gap between the, the, the wall and the, the mantle. It was really unsightly, and eventually, uh, one of the architects decided to take it off, fix the wall properly, and then put it back. You know, caulking will only take you so far. Um, so they did that. And when they did that, they found a whole bunch of old cards. And this is one of them. And the others were visiting cards, so basically business cards, from officers of the regiments that were stationed at Osgood Hall right after the rebellion. So we're talking uh, cards from um, the 1840s. So that was really exciting. So there you are. This is what the entrance looks like nowadays. And this is what it looked like in the 1920s. Now, I will bring your attention to the floor here. Now, this is the seal of the Law Society. We don't use it very much anymore. Um, but it's still our corporate seal. Um, you can see here the Law Society of Upper Canada, which was the name of the Law Society um, until 2018. So it's a very recent change. And then here you have Hercules, who represents the strength of the law. And you'll notice that he carries a, um, the word escapes me. Anyways, he carries a big stick to make sure that you remind that the, the law is powerful. And then here uh, you've got the um, beaver, our Canadian mascot. You have the Magna Carta Anglia, the, the basis of our rights and freedoms. And then you have the scales, the, the figure of justice with her balance scales. Um, she has a blindfold because she's supposed to judge based on, um, she's, she's not supposed to judge based on appearances. She's supposed to, base, um, to judge based on facts. And she has the sword because she's the enforcer. 
Um, I always found it rather odd that you would give a sword to someone with a blindfold, but I'm not the person who devised this symbol. Um, the Law Society was, um, it was created in 1797, but it was incorporated in 1822, so um, it could purchase the land to build Osgood Hall. Now, this is one of our historical mysteries. It's, it's, we're still trying to figure that one out. So um, there are two of these paintings in the, the entrance hall. Um, there's a small one and there is a big one and they look almost exactly the same. So this is the large one. And this is the small one and they're facing one another. And we weren't quite figure out, we could quite figure out why there were two paintings like this or what the story behind them was. <clears throat> so um, one of the stories that I, I'd heard about it and that stuck with me was that apparently, let me head back, all these men here, let's see if I can, there you go. All these men here were all students of Bishop Strawn who had um, a, school, a school in Cornwall and um, a lot of the people who became uh, important in upper Canadian society at the time uh, went through that school. It was quite prominent. So, uh, the, so the, story, the story goes that these men who were all judges came together and commissioned a painting to be given to Bishop Strawn as you know, their mentor, as a, a way of thanking him and saying, look how well we did thanks to you. Now, so the story continues saying that the small painting was a draft for the larger painting and it was left unfinished in the studio of the artist. In the meantime, this man here on the left was not the same as in the other painting, walked in, he was also a student of Bishop Strong and he perhaps had wanted to be added to the painting um, not sure why he wanted to be put on top of the left, the left person, but who knows. Um, and then the painting was finished and purchased by this person. Now there was, we didn't have any documentation on about the story, whether it was true or not. And um, when I was trying to figure out, okay, how can we get more about this? Um, and I thought, you know, we use x-rays sometimes on paintings to try to determine the condition of the painting, to see if they were under paintings, for example, if the artist had changed their, their mind as, as the, the, pro, the project was progressing. And I thought, okay, let's try and do this. So I called the ROM and I asked them, you know, do you happen to know where you can get a painting x-ray? It's not like I could walk to the hospital and, and get it done. So they said, well, you're in luck. We have all this equipment here. And um, our Canadian, our curator, Canadian art is quite excited about this. And she wants to know about the story too. So come along, we'll do it for free for you. So I was really excited about this. And we got an x-ray done. And this is what it looks like. So I'll bring your attention here. So you have here one hand that's on the, the armrest. He has a hand on his knee. You've got two hands on the table here. So you've got a hand here. This is John Beverly Robinson, the guy who was above the fireplace. So you've got his hand here. And then you've got a hand here where you see mostly just the thumb and the index finger. That's also on the table. So let's head back. So that's the big painting. So we've got three hands. So there's, you can barely see a hand here on the armrest. You see the one hand with the thumb and the, the index. And then you've got John Beverly Robinson's hand. Now, if you look at the actual portrait that was scanned, there's only three hands as well. So you've got the one, the hand that we could really see well on the x-ray. You've got the hand on the knee that we could see well on the x-ray and then here you have John Beverly Robinson's hand but there's no hand here so the x-ray shows a hand but there's no hand here so we know for a fact that this guy here was painted on top of the man on the left in the other painting we still don't know why but um, we know that there's something something fishy going on there
Okay, so let's keep on going. So here you have um, um, one of the things that, that people are most curious about when we get into the benchers area. This is called a, a porter's chair. And it's normally it's it's meant for the servants who are responsible for opening the door once the family has retired. So um, and and because they have to be at, there at night, this is a lot more comfortable if you're going to have a little snooze if you compare it to this, for example. Um, this chair does not really belong to Osgood Hall. I mean, it it belongs to us, but um, it was donated to us um, by a judge, so it doesn't really have a history with the Law Society, but it's pretty cool. Someone once told me that this was a chair to smoke pot because as you're sitting in it, the smoke can stay around your head longer. So we are now in the benchers dining room. And this is supposed to be one of the oldest, no, this is supposed to be the oldest dining room in Canada. Um, and it, I have no proof of that whatsoever. So I really don't know. It, it kind of makes sense. I mean, there are very few buildings that are occupied by the same organizations for so long. Um, a lot of older buildings have been transformed into, you know, residences or offices or whatever, or museums. Um, so it is possible. Um, but as I said, I have no proof whatsoever. This dining room is used mainly, um, mainly by the, the benchers of the Law Society, so uh, our Board of, of Governors. And this is the same room as it was in um, 1932. This was a special luncheon for the, the call to the bar of the Honorable R.B. Bennett, the Prime Minister of Canada, and he's sitting right here. They don't, they don't look like people were having a lot of fun, but. And the food for this dining room used to come from here. So this is the, the fireplace for the original kitchen. Uh, for this wing. And this is a discovery we made right before the pandemic. Um, we had a mold problem in the basement. This is actually in the, the gardener's workshop. And we had a mold problem. We had to remove the wall. And this is what we found behind it. So this is the fireplace. And you can't really tell, but there's a there's a, like a bread oven right behind this pipe. It's been, um, it's been fixed since then. Um, it's been stabilized and we've removed the pipe so we could um, take a good look at it. Now, this is what it looks like inside the fireplace. And of course, I wanted to know what these bottles were. So this is what they are. So these are probably from the mid to uh, late 19th century. They're blacking bottles. And blacking was a type of uh, polish that you could use for, for boots and, and shoes. But um, in our case, I expect that it was probably used to clean um, stoves and grates for, for logs and coal. So, so nowadays, the food for this dining room uh, comes from the restaurant kitchen. Now, again, the, another view of the, of the dining room. Now, of course, organizations like the Law Society are always in evolution. And the population of the, of the country and the membership of the Law Society have changed over time, especially in the last few decades. And... <clears throat> The art collection, the portrait collection doesn't really reflect that. I mean, it's it's going to take a while for, for the collection to catch up. So one of our uh, former treasurer, uh, Malcolm Mercer, asked us to kind of come up with a project that would kind of show that there is more than what the portrait collection um, shows. And uh, one of the things that was done is that we replaced two of our portraits with TV screens that are framed like portraits so that they belong. And on them, we have a slideshow um, that shows images that shows that there's something else. So, um, for example, we have photos of a law office above a greasy spoon because not everybody works on Bay Street. Um, we have a photo of um, this woman who's just beaming and it's her, it's her call to the bar, but she has her eight year old son in her arms. And what's significant about this photo is that um, in the 50s, when you were called to the bar, most women would, would practice until they got married. And when they got married, they would abandon the profession. So the fact that she was being called to the bar and she had a child was quite 
quite uh, revolutionary at the time. So anyways, th that's what these images are. And these images, the slideshow is very slow. So the images only change every 10 minutes. So they, they're meant to have some permanence to show that these belong there. And um, you can't just kind of watch the whole thing in 30 seconds and then forget about it. You have, if you want to watch it, you have to take the time and, and appreciate it. So I know we're almost running out of time, so I'll, I'll speed it up a little bit. So here you have um, the bencher's second floor. And this is what we call the reception room. So now this, this if you're interested in historical architecture, um, this is a perfect example of why you have to do your research. Now, this is a photo from the 1950s. And as you can see, um, it's, it's a room fairly, you know, of it of its time. And these light fixtures are quite modern, actually. And then if you look at a picture from the two from around the year 2000, this room looks older. So um, you can see that um, this is what an interior designer thinks the 19th century is supposed to look like. So we've kind of gone back in time from a, a decoration point of view. And just to show you some of the repairs we've done and renovations and how the technologies changed over time and some of the old finishes. And this is what, what the, the room looks like now. So as you can see, you know, this it looks like this has been there for 200 years. So if you didn't know, if you had done your research, um, you, you would make the mistake of, uh, to assume that this was a really old um, decor. So let's head over to convocation room, which is where the meetings of the boards of the Law Society took place for a long time. We just moved them over to a newer space, uh, which allows a, a larger audience. So the, the meetings of convocation are open to the public, and this room just did not allow it. So th these are the same people that we saw having um, lunch earlier. And as you can see, it's a very homogeneous group of people. So I don't think there's anybody younger than oh, 70 in there. They're all men, they're all white. They're all probably from the same kind of social circles. And then this is a photo we took in 1997 for the Bicentennial of the Law Society. And you can see already the composition of the board had changed quite a bit and it's still changing. Now, this is just something I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but um, what's interesting here is that we've got five windows on this floor here. Um, inside, there are only three windows. So this is another one of these mysteries. We don't know whether these windows have been taken out or whether um, these were always blind windows they were put in just to kind of preserve the symmetry of the building. Now, here is convocation hall, which is now um, the Osgood Hall restaurant. It's not open right now, unfortunately, but um, this was built as an ex examination hall for the students. And it was a big deal when it was first built. Now, can I ask, is, is it the end of the world if I go over by five minutes? Uh, no, please continue. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is Convocation Hall when it was first built. This is kind of a Romanesque um, style. Um, you can see here these desks. I mean, the, the room was first built as an examination hall. The exams used to take place in the, the benchers wing where we were um, recently. And at some point, as more people wanted to join the legal profession, um, the desk kept on getting closer and closer and um, it was not good for exam purposes. So they decided to build Convocation Hall to address that issue. And here you have the view from the other end. And um, these columns are still in there. They're made of a pink granite, New Brunswick pink granite. They're still in there. You can't see them because they've been cover covered with um, pillars, but um, someone clever used a, um, what do you call that? You know, one of these cameras that you use to do stomach exams and things like that. And they kind of put them in the, the pillars and we saw that the columns are still there. 
an endoscope. That's the word. So the room uh, was used for um, exam classes. It was also used for other educational um, um, activities such as this, which was a mock trial. And these things were really popular with the people of Toronto. I mean, this was before the days of cable and streaming. And um, this was almost like going to the theater. So you can see there's a, a big audience watching um, the show. Um, it was also used for less educational activities such as huge balls that were the social event of the year um, in the late 19th century, um, so much so that the ancestor of the TTC used to divert streetcars to be able to accommodate the guests to this party. Now this is another view of Convocation Hall. And one of the notable features in this room are these um, torches here, which have been there since 1970. And we actually know where they come from. So if you remember when we were in the Great Library, there was this rock. Um, so as you can see, this is the, the Convocation Hall from um, the Middle Temple in London. Uh, right after the um, the blitz and um, you can see the the torches so this is where they came from uh, the torches were always electrical fixtures and uh, they survived the war um, they were there in that building since the night uh, until the 1960s at which point they thought that the light was too dim and they decided to replace them and there was a, an Ontario lawyer who was uh, also a member of the Middle Temple who saw that happening. And he says, well, if you're going to throw them out anyways, can I have them? And he took them with him, donated them to the Law Society, and they were installed in 1970. Now you recognize the seal of the Law Society. And uh, the coat of arms, I think that's Ontario. Um, there's also the coat of arms of the Royal Arms and the coat of arm, arms of Canada on the balcony. So another uh, notable feature in this uh, room are the um, stained glass windows. They're not very old. They were installed between 1983 and 1986, and they represent the heritage of law in Canada. Now this is the Law Society window. And if you know um, Osgoode Hall Law School, this is their coat of arms. This is the um, this is the flag of the Law Society. So we used to have a flag that would fly when the benchers were um, at Osgoode Hall. So that's what was on the flag. You've got the seal of the Law Society again here. And if you can't see it, this is um, an old image of the Law Society with its leaky dome. Now, this is normally the end of the tour, but I've got kind of a, a little bonus. You've been good to me. There you go. So this is um, this is uh, what we call the lower and upper barrister's lounge. This used to be the student's library when the law school was at Osgood Hall. It's kind of a, a neo-Gothic style. And the lower lounge has these kind of mythical figures. It's They're great. And in between, you've got these little medallions with really funny feet, uh, uh, creatures uh, like nasty squirrels and mean rabbits and, and it was they're, they're hilarious. And then the upper level has um, these carved figures. We're not quite sure who they are, but um, since we probably have a few history teachers here, um, I want to show you what's really creepy about these is that these were sculpted um, in 1950s, in 1915, and yet they strangely look like modern politicians. Look at that. Like even the way the hair is parted. This person must have had a crystal ball. Have any of these politicians been shown this photo by photo comparison? Mm, no, I'm not sure I'd want to. They're not all flattering. I think we should CC them all. <laughs> yeah. Well, a few of them are dead, but yes. Yeah. So this is basically the end of my tour. So I'll stop sharing. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. 
at least I'm not sure if you were seeing the chat throughout, but the audience was very engaged, um, both with, with questions that we asked, but also just remarking throughout your tour. Um, as someone who has been fortunate enough to be in that space myself, um, but not for a few years, it really took me back and, and brought my attention to many details that I never would have noticed otherwise. So thank you so much. My appreciation has definitely deepened for uh, that beautiful uh, space of ours. Thank you. My pleasure. And lastly, I'd just like to uh, bring everyone's attention to, uh, we're kind of over the hump now, uh, but we do have a few more fantastic uh, events, part of our Summer Law Institute, uh, continuing tomorrow morning um, and then concluding on Friday morning. So please do join us. Um, we would like to thank the Law Foundation of Ontario's OGEN's core funder uh, for um, providing us with the resources that allow us to do this. And again, um, thank you, Elise. I had put um, a link in the chat that it is a subject of our OGEN website that contains links to the Arts and the Courts website, which has a link to, which presents this tour, not of course, uh, as well as Elise, but uh, in a way that you can always access it. And uh, the art installations that are around the courthouses in downtown Toronto. And then also there's a link to the Osgood Hall uh, app. So um, thanks again to Elise and uh, thank you all for attending and we will um, see you soon. And Maureen has raised her hand. So I wanna give her the opportunity to speak, but the rest of you have a great day.